Greetings War Thunderers, this is Longshot, with a guide on how to fly the Yak-3 in Arcade. Now, some of you may be asking why a guide for this plane is even necessary, and I think that stems from three misconceptions. Firstly, it's often lumped in with the Yak-3P, which is a brutally effective plane. If the Yak-3P is that good, then so must the Yak-3, right? And secondly, it's Russian and it's a Yak, therefore it must be overpowered and easy to fly because Russian bias. And lastly, because it's known to have the flight model of a UFO. And the reason I disagree with these beliefs is that in my own personal experience, I have in the past struggled to be nearly as effective in this plane as I am with the Yak-9T, and I don't believe that I'm alone in that. So in this video I'll look at what makes the Yak-3 unique, and demonstrate tactics that will help you get the most out of the plane. Firstly, the Yak-3 is not a Yak-9. It's considerably smaller and lighter. It was designed to combat enemy fighters, whereas the Yak-9s carried the heavy weaponry needed to take down German bombers and ground attackers. Taking a quick look at its armour, just some plating behind the pilot, there's nothing to protect him in head-ons. The X-ray shows large fuel tanks in the wings. Now I know a lot of people say that Yaks don't burn or always put their fires out, but in my experience they catch a light as easily as any other plane, and for me at least they're not that good at putting fires out. OK, I'll take it up in a custom battle to test its flight characteristics. And here's my, st uh, my setup. Uh, stealth for both cannon and machine guns, and 800 meters convergence because the weapons are nose mounted. The plane spawns in during about 340 km an hour, so I lift smoothly into a climbing turn, then lower the nose to reach the ideal climbing speed of 280 km an hour. The 110% WEP continues up past bomber altitude, and unlike many arcade fighters which get a huge boost from WEP, this plane doesn't get much additional power, but it really doesn't seem to matter much. It will climb to around 4,000 metres in two WEPs from a 2,000 metre spawn, which is a good climb rate, but not a great one, so climbing to the side is often a good idea. OK, let's take a look at its roll rate and I'll compare it to the Act 9 t As you can see, the Act 3 rolls faster, but not as quick as I-185s or Foghoff 190s. Next I'll put the planes into a horizontal turn to compare the strength of the elevators with flaps raised. The 9T turns a little faster, but that's not the whole story here. Look at the Yak-3's speed as I continue to turn, still way over 400 km an hour. And by comparison, the 9T is travelling at 330 km an hour, and gradually slowing down, which makes sense as it's a heavier plane. The lighter Yak-3 has an extraordinary ability to retain its high speed in hard turns, which I think is largely responsible for its reputation as a UFO. And because it has so much speed to burn, let me try this again with combat flaps. This time the Yak-3 drops to the mid 300 km an hour range, which is still very fast in a turn. And what's more, it's now outturning the 9T, which has slowed to 290 km an hour. Seeing it's doing so well with combat flaps, I'll go even further and try landing flaps. I won't show the 9T for this, as its turning ability degraded severely with the landing flaps deployed. Speeds down to the low 300s now, which is still very good in a turn, and the turning circle is fairly tight and it's almost catching its smoke trail. So if you have to turn sharply in this plane, I highly recommend landing flaps. There really doesn't seem to be any downside to using them. But that doesn't mean using flaps every time you want to turn, as you have the option of keeping them raised and retaining your speed at a level that few other planes can match. OK, so that's the elevators. Let's check out the rudder. Yak-9s have strong rudders, similar to those on the BF-109, but the Yak-3s is not quite as dominant. Certainly it's pretty good, but the 9T is pulling a much sharper and tighter turn here. It's a bit hard to see visually. As the speed drops below 260 km an hour, the Yak-3 stops climbing as well. You can see its spiral begin to flatten out. And this can be overcome by deploying combat flaps. They give the wings that extra bit of lift, and as I showed earlier, they really don't slow this plane down as much as they do on other planes. And those flaps really are making a difference here. Suddenly the plane can climb, and now it's performing the climbing spiral almost as strongly as a BF-109F4. Uh, almost, but not quite. OK, moving on to the high-speed handling test. Putting both planes into a dive, and I'll see what happens to their roll rate. Both the Yak-3 and 9T suffer a fair degree of lock-up to the ailerons at high speed, but not quite so much as to make them unflyable at those speeds. 
Both the Axe hit a top speed of only 760 km an hour in the dive, slower than the 820 km an hour of a Spit 2B and the 860 km an hour of a BF 109F4. The handling at these speeds is quite good, but that limited top speed is a weakness. If you get into trouble in a Yak-3, the chances are you will not be able to escape by diving. Let's see how much altitude it can recover in a vertical zoom climb, which I'm performing for test purposes only. Don't make a habit of going straight up like this in an RK battle. I was doing 700 kilometers an hour when I started this climb, and I recovered 2.4 kilometers of altitude before it drops under 200, uh, 200 kilometers an hour, which is very good indeed. That's not energy retention so much as a light airframe combined with a very powerful engine. Into a stall hammerhead, and it flips over very quickly without any loss of control. OK, so the plane is unique in many ways, and quite different from the earlier Yaks. To start with, let's look at how it performs at what passes for high altitude in Arcade. This is Mozdok Domination. I've climbed to 3,600 metres, and I'm looking to start boom and zooming when I notice a Focke-Wulf 190A4 who's climbed out to the side and has an altitude advantage on me. I'm into a shallow dive to gain speed in order to meet the inevitable head-on. Then I lift up expecting him to be diving at me, but he's taking his time, so I send some bullets in his direction. Here he comes, and I'm quickly out of the way with a snap roll. And he's going to put that oil leak out because he must have self-sealing oil tanks. Now he's not travelling that fast away from me, not as much as I expected. He must have lost a lot of speed in that climb before he dived at me. But even so, he's still he's leaving me behind. The question is, can I run him down? All depends on how sharply he decides to want to climb. There goes his oil leak. Here he goes, he's climbing now. Now it's a question of whether I can use my shallow dive speed and Wep's just come back online. No, not landing a hit. There's another hit. I mean, I don't hope to shoot him down here. I just want to panic him into starting to turn with me instead of flying away. But as you can see, despite his manoeuvring, He's gaining ground on me. So while this plane's no slouch, it's not especially fast at these altitudes, and there are quite a few planes like the 190A4 that will outperform it. And I'll come back to Delta 7 and his 190 later on in the video. Let's put its high-speed handling to the test with a long diving attack on the Britain domination map, which seems purposely designed for this tactic. And it's not just the handling that I'm looking at here, but also its ability to drop targets with a single 20mm cannon and two 12.7mm machine guns, which are pretty light armament for a Tier 3 4.0 rated plane, nothing like the devastating cannon on the Yak-9T. To shoot down targets with the Yak-3, you need to attack them from behind with a slight deflection angle, enough to expose the enemy plane and allow you to land a long, accurate burst. And that's why I use stealth, as that extra time on target is critical. If you use anything with Tracer, you'll alert the other player, they'll start to dodge, and you'll end up with fewer kills. Snapshots on sharp deflection angles are likely to only result in hits. It's rare to get a kill with that kind of shot, as will be demonstrated again as I line up this SB2C. But when you're travelling at high speed, that kind of shot is frequent. I fired at five targets on that long boom and zoom run, only came out of it with two kills, whereas if I'd made that run in a Yak-9T, I'd probably have managed four kills, maybe even five. And that's the difference armament can make. The Yak-3 is undeniably a far better plane, but with far less hitting power, and in the end, that really does count for a lot. Deflection shot on this DB-7, only scoring a hit, then dropping onto the A6M2 below, where I'll score another hit. And it can be rather frustrating considering how long it takes to climb and position your plane for this kind of high-speed attack. You need to be able to make the most of it and shoot down as many planes as possible on these low-altitude, fast boom and zoom runs. But when you came up, come out of a battle like this with more assists than kills and end up 10th on the leaderboard, it's so tempting to put the plane back in mothballs and fly something with a little more DACA. And for domination games, perhaps that's not really a bad idea. The Yak-3 flies beautifully through these manoeuvres, but that's not much use if you're struggling to shoot planes down. On that last attack, I engaged without a great deal of altitude, hence I've picked up a chaser. But I have just enough speed to run to the safety of incoming fighters. With the battle ending, I've had time for three long boom and extend attacks, which netted me a disappointing six assists and only three kills and a lost battle. The Act-3's comfort zone is not at ground level, it's between 2,000 and 4,500 metres, and there it becomes a brilliant plane, especially when you have altitude control over the enemy team. 
Here I'm in a shallow dive to attack this SP-2M, and I'm watching the Spitfire climbing on my right as he tries to follow a friendly A7M1. After I take out the bomber with a long steady burst at his wing, I'm using my speed to lift straight into the climb, knowing that the Spitfire will switch to me, as I'll be closer than the A7M. I'm keeping my climb, at climb angle shallow, as a steep climb will slow me down too quickly. The Spitfire is struggling, so it's time to hammer it over, and dive to complete the rope dope and the advantage of a rope dope is you get to focus your guns for a long burst at a slow moving target, and that's perfect for a plane with only one cannon. The energy retention of this plane also makes it a brilliant assassin in short turning battles against enemy fighters. After waving off my diving attack, watch how quickly I turn to follow this Focke Wolf 190, and my high speed puts me right on his tail at close range, ready to pick him off when he tries to turn. Speed is everything in this plane. It lets you pull off sharp turns like that and still be in position to attack a target and then get away, when in most other fighters the turn would slow you down and you'd be left in their dust trying to catch up. And I demonstrate that again in this next example. This P-51 wants a head-on. Obviously I'm not interested in that and I dodge with a snap roll. Okay, now I need to turn and follow him, and in many planes I'd be far behind by the time I made this turn. Not in the Yak-3. Yes, I am out of range, but not by much, and when he turns to engage the SB-2M beneath, I can easily anticipate his turn, and I'm very quickly in position for a long, accurate deflection shot. That's what makes this plane dangerous, provided you keep it fast, which is really not hard to do. It takes quite a lot of effort, in fact, to lose your speed in a Yak-3. Now the P-51 pilot has decided to climb up for revenge in a P-63. Obviously I have a massive energy advantage here, it's just a matter of timing my attack to catch him when he's stalled and can't force a head-on. Notice I use combat flaps here to slow my plane a little and get that extra lift from the wings while rolling into position. And again it takes a long steady burst to finish him off. So that's fighter suppression, which is a role this plane performs brilliantly, but it's also quite a decent bomber hunter, and again it's due to its speed and energy retention. This battle was like all my Christmases had come at once. Not only was I gifted control of altitude, the enemy kept spawning wave after wave of unprotected bombers. And I'm just waiting for that Peshka to stall, coming around with a flat rudder turn, and now I can swoop down and kill both of these bombers in a single diving attack. They're both travelling nice and slow, allowing me to hit them with long, accurate bursts, firing at the full profile of their planes. Then up into a zoom climb to prepare for the next wave. This time there's too many for me to shoot down. An SP-2C, a Welly and a Stuka. I expect the Stuka to dive, so I'll get behind them and then go for the Welly. And this diving attack will take me underneath the climbing SP-2C. I aim for the fuselage here, hoping for a pilot kill, but it's not to be. Perhaps I should have targeted a wing instead. Never mind, I'll zoom climb and hit the SB2C from underneath instead, and I close in so fast that I even surprise myself. Still travelling well over 400 km an hour, and I'm looking to attack the Wellington again from above, as he's flying level and hasn't dived yet. But on the way down I notice a climbing Yak-7 to my left. Yes, finally a fighter has decided to look upwards and take an interest in something happening above ground level. Obviously I have a vast energy advantage here. I'm looping over, hoping that he'll think I'm flying away, and therefore he'll continue to climb. Then I can turn and swoop in to catch him at a low uh, speed state, but I arrive a little late. He has time to drop his nose and go evasive. I zoom in, hoping for an accurate shot. Then he tries to break into a steep climb, but exposes the fuel tank in his wings. I think when people talk about yaks putting fires out, they're confusing them with LAR-5s. In my experience, a fire is deadly in this plane, and so it proves for that Yak-7. You're probably sick of my pointing it out, but look at my speed. Never once in that entire sequence attacking bombers and the yak did I drop below 300 km an hour. In fact, I was over 400 km an hour for most of the time, only slowed down during a climbing rudder turn. And that speed's carried me up to yet another bomber, and allowed me to Immel manoeuvre right into perfect position from which to finish him off. Of course you won't always have a tasty stream of bombers to feed on up here. There'll be plenty of games like this one where everyone is low. No bombers are spawning and the fighters are all diving straight to the deck. 
My strategy here is to gently press lower, keeping my plane as fast as possible and look to pick off anyone who shows any signs of wanting to climb. I've dropped down to 3000 metres, only 1000 metres above the fighter spawn which is off to my right. I'm flying directly above the thickest concentration of enemies as I continue my shallow dive. A P400 spawned in but I'm travelling much too quickly for him to catch me. And now a bow fighter below sees me and tries to climb off the deck and engage. This will be a simple kill and it takes me away from the fighter spawn. Because he's low on speed he's easy to hit with a long burst, which is exactly the kind of target I'm looking for. And better still, I can extend straight on and engage a Kai 102 with a deflection shot for a second kill. Now into a shallow zoom climb, not a steep one, as I look to see if I've attracted any chasers. Indeed I have. The P400 which spawned as I began that attack is 2 kilometers or so away and hasn't the speed to catch me. Now I could just extend and, cl and climb away from him but then I'd lose him. I need to do something to keep him interested so I'm going to start a slow climbing turn to the right. I'll continue to gain altitude on him but it'll be subtle and from his point of view it'll look like he's starting to reel me in. I've got to be careful not to lose too much speed in this climbing turn as the stall could be fatal if he has more energy than I expected. But as I watch he starts to show vapour trails from his wingtips, so he's really struggling now and it's time to attack. But I climbed into that turn which makes me a bit slow to get down to him. I'll get there a bit late but still with plenty of time to shoot him down, though for quite a while he refused to take his bullets. Which means a Spitfire has been able to climb above me now. There he is. But he'll be slow from his climb, whereas I have plenty of speed from the dive, it's simply a matter of flying away from him and climbing back up at a safe distance, leaving him behind. I guess I could have been aggressive and climbed straight at him to engage, but to my mind that'd be taking an unnecessary risk. Better to get in position and engage on my terms, rather than get embroiled in a dogfight where the other player has the advantage. Anyway, remember my friend Delta 7 and his high altitude Focke Wolf 190A4 from earlier in the video. He continued to build a huge energy advantage over me and follow me around from far above. And I realised I'd be wasting my time trying to compete with him so I started to work downwards, culminating in this diving attack on a Peshka. And now continuing straight down to ground level as I don't want to be caught under the enemy fighter spawn. I was hoping for targets to intercept along the way but they're all some distance off which left me running across the meadow on my own but not for long as Delta is diving all the way from 5,000 metres with the express purpose of attacking me. There he is, there's no doubting his intentions. And here's where I show how bad I am at looking backwards while flying close to the ground. That could have been very embarrassing to say the least. Ok, he's getting close so it's time to pull out my bag of evasive tricks, because he'll be flying fast. Braking, snap rolling, braking again while waiting for him to overshoot, which he doesn't so I cut throttle for good measure and that costs me a good shot at him while he extends away so I don't land any more hits. Looking backwards while evading is something I'm really concentrating on right now, I definitely need to improve in that regard. And quickly dodging that head on, and then I'm off flying to the opposite side of the battle while Delta climbs back onto his perch. Ok, now it's late in the game. I'm helping defend this airfield from enemy attempts to cap and yes, Delta is still stalking me from high above, as he's done for the entire battle. As usual I'm needing to land long steady bursts on targets to shoot them down. Snapshots are only good for assists. I'm not using flaps. There's no need right now, I prefer to keep my speed as high as possible, which in this plane of course is not hard to do. And it's about time I check to see what Delta's up to. There he is, only 1.5 kilometres above and closing so he's diving to attack. Into a high speed turn to make it hard for him to follow me as he dives, in fact there he is, en route to the ground at over 700 kilometres an hour. And I'm sorry Delta, I had to show that, it was hilarious at the time I was in stitches. It's all in good fun, if you're watching this I hope you don't mind. So to summarise, the Act 3 is a phenomenal plane, if kept between 300 and 600 kilometres an hour, flying below a ceiling of 5000 metres. Due to its armament, its success is highly dependent on your target selection. Prioritise planes that are travelling slowly, or use stall fighting tactics to get them slow, as that will maximise your chances of shooting them down. The most important rule of all in this plane is to watch your speed. 
Never let the plane drop below, uh, much below 300 km an hour. Be especially careful not to climb too steeply in a zoom. A shallow climbing angle will gain you altitude just as quickly without losing your speed. But that's all I have for this video. As always, I'll welcome your comments, and please look out for my next vid, where I'll be sticking with Russia, looking at surviving stock syndrome in the LA-9. So until then, this is Longshot signing off, and I'll be seeing you in the skies.